the closest recount. It's really uh, a toss-up. I just have to say it's really too close to call at this point. You're up, so you're down. It's a part of, of the process, I guess. You know, it's a close election. This is just a testament of what the district was looking for, which was a fresh race. Just two votes separate candidates for Congress. Get jabbed or lose your job. Aggressive governor. State of Florida will be filing uh, the lawsuit. DeSantis sues Biden over mandates. All I have to say is that you're a sorry <laughs> We don't care that you have cancer. Ugly and public. The Surgeon General comes with two aides and I asked him to put on a mask, and he won't. The office incident between the state senator and the Surgeon General. Democracy works, right? The University of Florida says no to faculty testimony. There's just this fear. We have become a political plaything of Tallahassee. The UF president reverses course. It's all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg. If there were ever an example of every vote counts, we are watching that right now. Recounts are complete. And as we stand today, the two Democrats running to be South Florida's next member of Congress are two, two votes apart. Wow, congressional candidates Dale Holness and Sheila Scherfelis McCormack were there on Friday watching as the Broward Canvassy Board certified the recounts, all that left now, all that is left now to count are the overseas and military votes. They are due by 5 o'clock Friday afternoon. Joe Scott is Broward's Supervisor of Elections with us today after a dramatic and busy week. Joe, great to see you. Thanks so much for being with us. You got an extra hour of sleep, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, good morning, Glenn and Michael. Thank you for having me on. Thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, Glenn was in your office Thursday. I was there on Friday, and, I'm, and I have to say I was impressed by the efficiency, the speed with which you and your staff work. You run right through the, the recounts uh, manually and the machine recounts. Have you ever seen an election this close? Uh, I, I don't believe we've had one in Broward County this close in quite a while. And uh, so certainly not on my watch since this is uh, probably the first really big election that I've, uh, that I've managed as supervisor. Right. And when you were elected um, just at the beginning of this year, right, it's uh, has it been a year yet? My time. It has. My, yes. My time is going by so quickly. <laughs> so you had said you were going to put in some changes. You know, the Broward Supervisor of Elections Office has gone through a decade or so of drama. So you put in some changes, not expecting this kind of recount. But but what kind of changes did you have in place for this? And, and did they work? Uh, well, absolutely. So we've actually done a number of things uh, in the first few months that were really about increasing accessibility and making it easier for people to vote. Uh, we opened up several satellite or branch offices across the county, and we had a lot more drop boxes available for folks to drop off their ballots for this special election, whereas normally the last two days, there would only be two locations you could go to. For this special election, we actually had five locations just for this small special election that people could go and drop off their ballots during the last uh, 48 hours of the race. Yeah, uh, Joe, you know, I would like to emphasize for our viewers how scrupulous you and the canvassing board were on Friday as, as the board, and you are a member of the board, uh, yes. examined ballots that had been rejected earlier because of signature discrepancies you had what five were represented to be considered and you recommended the two be accepted because the time lapsed between the original voter registration signature and the vote um, on Tuesday uh, or the vote by mail ballots had just been a long time 26 years in one case yeah so the so one of the uh so the council for one of the candidates did ask us if they could just have another public viewing where we lay out all the ballots that we had just rejected so they could take a look and sort of uh, come up with some and, and the council did com come up with some compelling arguments and that led us to say okay let us look back and see if we can find more information to see if we can validate that these voters are in fact the ones who signed the envelopes and when we did find that new evidence, we found some new um, information and we brought that to bear. It did cause us to say, OK, at this point, maybe there are a couple of these that we need to bring back in, especially with it being such a close race. The last thing we want to do is disenfranchise anyone. 
um, when, when, uh, when every single vote is going to count here. So you did, and the canvassing board did, reject a ballot that came in unsigned. In fact, it was, it was such a moment, I put it up on my Twitter feed on Thursday. Uh, some research showed that the ballot was from someone who had been deceased. So you want to take a look at this for just a moment? Is there sound here? Rejection. Um, so there's that ballot, unsigned, never opened, rejected because you learned that the voter was deceased. But why not go further to find out whether this was just a mistake or potential fraud? Wouldn't that be something that the office would want to know and, and follow up on? Uh, no, so this is just this is an example of the system working exact exactly the way that it is supposed to. Um, you know, we have some um, in some cases, uh, we actually had some where the people are returning the ballot to us and letting us know that the person is deceased. And because they're returning the ballot and letting us know the person is deceased, it is something that there isn't actually an automatic um, procedure for. So it needs to come before the canvassing board. But this, again, is just a, a great example of the system working exactly the way that it was supposed to. Yeah. Uh, Joe, you reported to us that um, several hundred ballots arrived there at election headquarters after 5 p.m. on Tuesday, and therefore they did not count. Now, you had a problem with the United States Postal Service. You went to the Opelika station. You tried to get some information to make sure you were getting all the ballots. Did they not cooperate with you? Uh, yeah, that is correct. So, um, you know, I feel like as, as an elections official, it's very important that I do everything that I can to make sure that we're getting all the ballots back to our facility and that we get every vote counted. As part of that, I've had a close relationship. I've uh, continuously communicated with uh, people at the at the um, post with the Postal Service. Uh, when I showed up there, I, I had I think I had a simple request that I actually wanted to go inside and kind of take a look at how they were handling all the ballots and getting them through the system. And they refused to allow me in. I, I found the lack of transparency very disturbing. And I think this is something that needs to really be addressed. Um, that elections officials need to have access to those facilities so that we can uh, provide a little bit of oversight and make sure that our um, that our that our ballots are making it to us on time. And voters need to look at that and, and consider that too when they're yeah. deciding to vote by mail and really make allowances for that time frame. You said something before about the extra drop boxes and the extra hours that you had put in. Those this is really the first election under the state's new election law that's being challenged in court right now. Um, how did the new rules, stricter ID requirements, limited hours, and some stricter security on drop boxes, how did that affect this vote? Was Did you see positive effects, any negative effects? What did you see? Uh, you know, so we put forth a lot more effort to make sure that people had a lot of different options to where they could drop off their vote by mail ballot. So more options than they had before, um, but fewer hours. Um, so I believe that overall, we ended up seeing more participation by vote by mail. We actually saw uh, a much bigger, uh, you know, overall, uh, a huge number of the, the, the vote actually came in by mail. Uh, so, so vote by mail is something that is very important to the electorate at this point. And, you know, we did everything that we could to try to make it, make it work. And, I, and because of that, I think we didn't have a, a big drop off. Uh, Joe, we saw this week that Governor DeSantis announced that he wants to create a sort of an elections enforcement office where people who are sworn law enforcement officers are going to look around the state for instances of election fraud. Um, you know, frankly, uh, in the tenure, your tenure, uh, and in Miami-Dade County, uh, we don't know of any instances of outright election fraud over the last several years. Do you know of any? Uh, no, I don't. Um, other than uh, the probably the biggest uh, election fraud case that we uh, are currently seeing is the one that happened in Miami where there was a, a state Senate uh, candidate who was placed in the race and funded uh, for the sole purpose of, uh, of deceiving voters. Um, so that would be the one case of election fraud that we that we've really seen here. Yeah. Um, and may I, may I just interrupt to say that my friend and colleague Glenna broke that story. And, you know, the former state senator, Frank Cortillas, is still facing a trial in that case. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of 
you know, having more law enforcement uh, focused on election fraud, my biggest concern is that this has been uh, politicized to such a to such a degree that there's really a, a genuine concern that the focus would be disproportionate on uh, communities that they feel like are going to more likely vote for the other side. And and, and I just feel like our, our governor has been very, very um, partisan in his approach to how he's talked about elections and how, you know, and how he's approached um, election reform. And that just makes it very concerning, you know, for elections officials to see that they're adding uh, some kind of new law enforcement agency. We all want to see uh, voter fraud prevented. We all want integrity in our elections, but we want to make sure that it's that the enforcement is done in a fair way and that one side isn't disproportionately um, is dis uh, under the microscope. Uh, so to say. And part of our job, like yours, is to watch that and report on it and make sure that you're right. Joe Scott, great to have you today. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, and it's not over yet, so we'll see you this week. <laughs> yeah, we will see you on Friday for the final results. Up next, academic freedom and a First Amendment were tested this week at the University of Florida. The university passed that test, but only after it stumbled at the outset. We are going to talk to a UF faculty leader after the break. First the backlash and then the backpedal. And now the University of Florida will allow three of its political science professors to serve as expert witnesses in a lawsuit challenging new state voting laws. University administrators at first banned their participation. They called it against the state school's interest. And then they said outside pay for the professor's testimony was also against the rules. Then they reversed that too after a public outcry accusing the university of violating First Amendment rights and academic freedom precious rights, which uh, have been upheld by the University of uh, Florida for a long time. Still, the UF Faculty Union is calling for a boycott. Its vice president is Dr. Mira Satharam, who joins us now live from Gainesville. Good morning. Great to see you. Great to meet you. And thank you for weighing in with us today. Hello. Yeah, we appreciate your participation. Uh, let's just say it at the outset. The University of Florida is the flagship university uh, in the state of Florida, one of the best public universities, ranked among the best in the country, and its integrity was really put in question by this episode, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. A woman of few words. Let's, let's <laughs> delve a little deeper, Dr. Setharam. This There are some, admittedly, watching this from afar, which we are in, in uh, South Florida, some mixed messaging from, appears to be mixed messaging from the university at first, talking about uh, asking these professors not to do this testimony because it would be in, in not in the best interests of the university, maybe a conflict of interest, uh, then went on to talk about, well, it was about pay and outside pay. And, and now it reversed again and said, okay, it's fine, go ahead and do it, say what you want and get paid. What do you think was the cause of the reversal? Because from, from where we sit, it looked like it was the public backlash. It looked like a giant perception problem. What does it look like to you? Yes, um, they, if they could have gotten away with it, they would have. Um, so let me start with all the different things that have happened at the University of Florida since about March of 2020. So first there was a law uh, that essentially said, citing supposed foreign interference, undue foreign interference in university research and that intellectual property was being stolen, that uh, all outside activities had to be reported in a quite a um, how shall I say, a, ma a way in which that policed outside activity of uh, faculty members. Then I was part of the team that bargained for the union uh, as part of our collective new collective bargaining agreement, the outside activities article, which clearly defined conflict of interest, uh, which certainly did not define it the way 
uh, they used the words when they denied this activity. Well, let's let's look. Let's tech, can we? I don't mean to interrupt, but let let's delve into a little bit about that because you said they were trying to get away with something, and they're defining conflict of interest. W what is? What do you think that the university is trying to get away with, and what is that conflict of interest? Uh, the actual definition of conflict of interest is quite straightforward. We are public employees. We're not supposed to do any favors to people misusing or abusing our position as uh, public employees. This is part of the public ethics uh, statute of the state. The other important thing is that my outside activity should not somehow uh, um, adversely affect my judgment in performing my inside activities as an academic researcher, teacher, and um, person who uh, it takes part in various collective decision making regarding academic uh, activities within the state of Florida, uh, within the University of Florida. So basically, the fact that their definition of quote unquote adverse to the interests of UF uh, vastly extended anything that you might think of as being adverse to the uh, interests of UF. It's dangerous to think that testifying in a uh, testifying against the state in a voting rights uh, or anti-voting rights lawsuit um, uh, would then be uh, somehow adverse to the interests of Flor University of Florida. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't fit what was agreed upon. Uh, so uh, it, it was basically against not just the First Amendment rights of these public employees, but it was also against academic freedom. It was against our conflict of interest right. article. Yeah. It was against everything. Yeah. Dr. Sethram, uh, I would point out that the three political science professors who are Daniel Smith, Michael McDonald, and Sharon Austin have testified across the country in various lawsuits. They are acknowledged experts uh, in their fields. And the fact that they had been hired to buy plaintiffs in a lawsuit, you know, contesting these new vote, the new voting law in Florida, uh, they had testified before but it, they were they were being chastised and told they couldn't do it in this case. I mean, what changed? Was it a political influence? Were the members of the board of trustees trying to put pressure on Dr. Fuchs? So things have changed, as I started out saying, since uh, about March of 2020, after this new law and uh, uh, trying to police outside activities, there's also been for example, the refusal of mask mandate or prohibition of mask mandate or not doing this, uh, not doing things or doing things ostensibly to please higher political powers. Some of them came up, came through direct orders from the state. Some of them seem to be sort of informally communicated or not communicated at all, but just uh, preemptively the university has sort of uh, paid a rush to pay some kind of deference probably because they're trying to make sure that state funding is not cut. But the fact that you were worried about state funding being cut is itself corruption. And the fact that you preemptively uh, start doing things that uh, the, the political forces want you to do is ethically corrupt. So the, I think that all of it uh, essentially um, adds up to undue influence yeah. uh, in mm -hmm. uh, what should be a free a place of free inquiry. The governor, just um, for, for the record, the governor has publicly stated that he has not mm -hmm. influenced the university at all, and yes. neither has any of the state departments done so. Do, do you believe otherwise? Do you have evidence of otherwise? Or are you laying blame squarely at UF's administration? Uh, if there was influence, it's not in the public records. So one way or the other, the UF's administration has to answer. And I would like to add that what you call a reversal is not quite a reversal. What they have done is uh, appointed an internal board consisting of the provost and other uh, administrators hand handpicked by the administration so it's like the administration is investigating itself. It doesn't make much sense. I mean, the union has called for an external review uh, and uh, upholding of academic explicit apologies and upholding of academic freedom, which uh, only then would I call it even a partial reversal. Yeah. At the moment, you know, they're trying to make sure that the 24 hour news cycle 
turns away because they claim it's a reversal. Yeah. Uh, Professor, uh, I know that the United Faculty of Florida, of which you are vice president, issued a statement on Friday that called on the University of Florida, quote, make a clear and unambiguous commitment to academic freedom going forward, also called for an external review of U.S. practices regarding requests for approval of outside scholarly activities. Is that going to happen? We're going to keep asking for it. We would hope that the accreditor who is looking at the University of Florida precisely towards uh, figuring out whether there was undue political influence, I hope that they will in ensure that there is external review, not just an internal review by those administrators who are potentially culpable in the whole affair. And also worth it to note that the three professors involved are now also filing their own lawsuits. Dr. Mira Sitharam, good to have you with us today and thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, up next, Senator Tina Polsky, who says she was disrespected by the state's new Surgeon General. But that mask incident in her office has blown up into something much uglier, and that's next. Our next guest was the recipient of this ugly phone message. Listen for yourself. I don't care about your cancer. You go and you huddle with other people without a mask, but then you have a problem with a Republican? You, you piece of you do mother off and die. Whoa, that is about as ugly as it gets. That was a call to State Senator Tina Polsky's office. She's from Boca Raton. After she asked the state surgeon general to leave her office after he refused to put on a face mask. Senator Polsky is in treatment for breast cancer with compromised immunities. A few days after that meeting, Surgeon General Joseph Latipo responded that he could not communicate well wearing a mask. Florida's Senate president condemned what he called that lack of respect, but then came those ugly messages by phone and by social media. Senator Polsky joins us today via Zoom. First of all, Senator, welcome, and how, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm actually feeling very well. I completed my radiation treatment last week and uh, will be probably getting some medication going forward. But otherwise, you know, a lot is behind me and I'm looking forward to getting back to Tallahassee in uh, the week after next. Well, that is all good news. Uh, Senator Polsky, describe to us late October, you're in your office. Uh, the new Surgeon General says, I want to come by, have a chat with you. Tell us what happened. So he scheduled an appointment in my office and I have set up a mask rule in my office because I had my diagnosis in September. So before I came back for the committee weeks and knew I'd be meeting with a lot of different folks, we decided to set up a rule. We have a sign outside and we have plenty of masks available in our waiting area. And um, he came with two aides and I asked him to put on a mask and he refused. And unfortunately, it turned into kind of a debate standing in the waiting room of my office and went on way longer than it should. And, you know, I was in I was wearing a mask and my aide was, but it's just too close proximity. And I was very uncomfortable. And after a little while of this discussion going back and forth, uh, I asked him to leave. I said, you know, I know all I need to know about you as the Surgeon General, if you won't respect my wishes. I said I have a serious health condition. I didn't say what it was at the time because I hadn't been public yet. And after the incident, I just knew I had to go public with my own diagnosis. I was planning on it anyway. This just sort of sped me up. And then after that announcement, then I came out with the story about the Surgeon General. This man is supposed to be our top public health official, and he can't even respect the wishes of a patient, who, a patient, a citizen who asks him to please put on a mask. I mean, the simplest accommodation. He All he had to say was, Senator, I disagree with your position on masks, but if it makes you feel more comfortable, I'll put it on and we can proceed. And let me explain to you why I think masks yeah. don't work. Did he, okay, did he, fine. Did he, did he give you a reason why he was going to refuse to put a mask on after you asked him? I think he was kind of prepared for it because I asked him to put it on. He said, I don't do interviews in masks. Huh. And he said we could go outside or go in the hallway, but neither of those were appropriate locations to hold this very important conversation. I had a lot of questions for him. I'm on the Ethics and Elections Committee, and I get to vote for him. 
and ask him questions. And so I thought it was important that we sit in my office like I do with everyone else who visits me. And I've had 100% compliance. It's never been a problem. I asked him, is there a particular reason you can't wear a mask? And he wouldn't give me an answer. Senator Polsky, I want to ask you a question born of a perch where we are sort of nonpartisan and objective and try to stay out of the political drama, which clearly masks have become by all accounts. Shockingly, what, yes. What what is um, what was the purpose of not dealing with this in a more internal way? Uh, clearly, you were upset. Clearly, what he did upset you. Uh, clearly, it has future implications for his job. Why not deal with that in a more um, a more internal way instead of making it public, knowing that or and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm sure you assumed that it would sort of take on this partisan overtones that it had? Well, I did try to deal with it in an internal way. I asked him many times to put on a mask in my office. Had he done that, there never would have been a story. And he just refused. I, I guess my, my question is not about the mask so much, but about his refusal. Why not deal with that within the Senate offices? You know, the Senate president weighed in and, and did condemn that, what he called a lack of respect for you. Um, but but it, in becoming public, it sort of fed into the machine of ugliness that all of us have seen on all sides of the political spectrum, uh, as evidenced by the phone call that you received. I think it was just too important to kind of let it die out, the story, as if I had just reported to the Senate office, then what? Then they would have said, oh, that's too bad, unfortunate. It never would have gotten the attention that it deserves because this is supposed to be the top public official. How can he be in charge of 21 million people's health when he didn't even care about mine? And he couldn't even do the most simple task that doctors do every single day. And as he was walking out, I said, don't you wear a mask in surgery? And he just kind of laughed it off. And then he made a comment. I like to um, have fun with unreasonable people, something along those lines. And my aide heard him say verbatim. So this was just too important. I represent over half a million people. They needed to know what's going on. Every single day, I receive emails and phone calls from constituents and people all across the state about every issue up and down, um, you know, the legislature, anything, everything you can imagine. And so they have a right to know who the governor put up, this man who doesn't, is unfit to be the top public health person in our state, and they all deserve that information. Yeah, so they uh, could write to their senators and their representatives and tell them how they feel. Senator, I take it when you get a chance to vote on his confirmation, you will vote no. What do you think your uh, colleagues in the Senate are going to do? I know Senator uh, Wilton Simpson, the president of the Senate, came to your defense. He said that Dr. Lampado had acted unprofessionally. How, what is your sense about his confirmation? Yeah, and that's exactly, you know, why I think it's so important that to show that it's a bipartisan in nature, that what he did to me was not partisan. What he did to me was just wrong on so many levels. Um, and so having that bipartisan support in the Senate is really important to me, and I, I'm very, very grateful to have it. I think personally what's going to happen is they will not hold confirmation hearings. His time will run out in this session. And then the governor can renominate him, and we have one more session where he can serve. Uh, and if we don't have a confirmation hearing next year, meaning the year after this this legislative session, then he's out. So maybe the easiest way for them to manage it is to not hold the hearings rather than put up everyone for a yes or no vote on him. Uh, just for the record, we have been inviting the new Surgeon General to join us mm -hmm. here on This Week in South Florida, both before this subject ever came up and again after. Uh, hasn't been able to so far, but we hope that he will accept soon. Um, one more question to you, Senator, about some of the criticism I've heard about this incident. There are people who, uh, you know, there are people who do not dispute the science that masks do have some ounce of prevention against all communicable diseases. Um, and there are critics who say that they've seen you in your social media unmasked, holding um, court in your office, even hugging other people unmasked, and, and question why you are so upset about this incident. Uh, is that a valid criticism? And, and maybe explain why that is. It's not valid. And actually, uh, you don't have it correct. Um, there's no pictures of me hugging anyone unmasked. Um, there are they these people combed through Facebook and hours of committee hearings to find me unmasked next to people 
that I know who are vaccinated. And it is not up to anyone else to tell me when I feel safe and when I feel comfortable in a situation. It is up to me. And in my office, that's the other thing. I've never had um, meetings with people who have come in to see me without masks in my office. So none of those pictures were in my office. And I've been 100% compliant. So in a, in a closed office space where I hold meetings with multiple people at a time that we are not able to be six feet apart, then I ask people to wear a mask. And that's where I feel comfortable and that's where I've set the rules. So he should have respected my wishes. It doesn't matter what I do elsewhere. All he had to do was respect my wishes uh, when he came to my office and he failed to do so. Yeah. Senator Polsky, uh, respect is the word of the day and you have ours and uh, we thank you for being with us today. I just want to uh, mention one thing before we go to a tease that even vaccinated people can spread COVID um, and that is also science. So I just wanted to put that on the record. And that's why we wear masks to give us an extra ounce of protection because if you sneeze, it'll be caught in the mask and, or cough and I don't want to be the recipient while I was in the middle of cancer treatment that would have delayed my treatment. So I would appreciate everyone just really accepting you know my decision about how i feel safe senator thanks to you we best of luck you. Uh, on your health we wish you all the best thanks very thank much. you so much our, all right up next we're going to have a virtual version of our famed round table <laughs> on the plate vaccine mandates and the maneuvering against them stay tuned During the pandemic, we had to forego our roundtable where guests with a wide range of political perspectives, points of view, would come in and weigh in on the week's top stories. This week, Florida sued the Biden administration over the vaccine mandate and with a special session on COVID-related related policies coming up next week, it's time to take that dive and welcome back two of our all-stars. Both are South Florida attorneys involved in business and governmental issues. Marilee Cancio in Cape Coral with us today, also an influential voice in the Republican politics in Florida and beyond. And Chris Smith in Fort Lauderdale, a former Democratic state senator and rep. It is so great to have yeah. you, and I wish you were here with us. I know. I wish I was there, too. Nice to talk to you, Glenn and Michael. It's great to have you I both miss back. you guys. Uh, yes. <laughs> let's begin with uh, th this latest court ruling out of New Orleans where the appeals court said the president's uh, widely brooded, you know, new policy saying that uh, companies with 100 employees or more had to mandate max, uh, mass or vaccine vaccines vaccinations by January 4th. The court says you got to prove that it's constitutional. Marilee, what do you think the fate of that policy is going to be? Look, that's going to be challenged all over the place. There's the court found that the petitioners, which included several states and private individuals, raised good issues that this mandate is unconstitutional. This is an attack on small businesses, frontline workers, and the American people. And I think that's what we're gonna see across the line. The constitution uh, was made not to limit the power of the people, but to limit the power of the government. And this is a complete outreach by the federal government. So, so Chris, is this a ruling by the Fifth Circuit for the Fifth Circuit, or does this apply nationwide? It applies, well, it will be applied nationwide, but I think you're going to see this fast track up to the Supreme Court. This is such a huge issue and such a public health issue. The Supreme Court is going to have to weigh in soon. And then there's going to be very interesting to see this new makeup of the Supreme Court, how they rule on this type of case that historically um, has been allowed within, within the United States. Uh, but the Supreme Court is going to have to weigh in soon. So the new, I think it's I think it's yeah. important to say that uh, being against the mandate it's not being against vaccines. This has to do with the Constitution and the power of the federal government. And I think it's important to differentiate that because we went from saying two weeks to slow the spread to ha having two shots to keep your job. And I think that's a problem. I'm fully vaccinated now with two shots. But what if they start demanding that you have a booster? What about a fourth booster like in other countries? So it gets to the point that where does it stop? And I think you need well, to it, listen it, to the science. Th this, is, this is a public health crisis. 750,000 Americans have died because of this. After 9-11, when 3,000 died, we, we gave up some liberties and we did some stuff. But now you have 750,000 dead. I think that if we have a public health crisis, 
that we do have to do these things. Um, if you look at school children, we've all discussed it from measles to smallpox, we've all had to get vaccinations in order to stay in this society. And I think that, that that's, that's totally reasonable. When you look at 750,000 Americans have died. You know, that, that was always one of the questions I had, Mary Lee, was that what's the difference between mandating this vaccine and mandating the vaccines that I know, you know, my kids couldn't go to school before I could yeah. prove that they got a whole series of vaccines and, and doubled yeah. and boosters. What, what is the difference? Well, see. because there's a whole series of different vaccines out there. For example, the flu kills many people every year, but businesses don't say you have to get the flu vaccine every year in order to keep your job. So I think people need to make their own decisions. And what we're seeing this year in elections across the country is, for example, that the parents should choose what's best for their children. This just happened this week as well when some of the school board districts sued and, uh, the state because the state said that the schools had to listen to the parents. And what we're seeing is that the parents are winning this. The parents should make the choices for their children and for themselves. And that's what it's coming out to. This is not about the vaccines. This is about the mandate. And this is what we're seeing in the moment yeah. is that the federal government wants to control our lives. And this well, has- You have to and listen to all other, yeah. Another Chris, thing- Chris uh, Smith, let, let, let me okay, ask I'm you sorry. this question because Mary Lee raised it appropriately, and that is, you know, Governor DeSantis has made this whole argument philosophically about personal choice and parental supervision, uh, the rights of parents to be able to choose for their children. That, I mean, that that is what this really has come down to, isn't it? Well, what about me as a parent? I have a child in public school, and I have the right to be able to send my child to school without fear that he's going to come home with a deadly disease. There are other parents, there's a majority of the parents who want to send their kids to public schools but don't want to subject them to a deadly disease. So explain so that, about Chris, one set Chris of though, yes. explain that because if you as a parent decide your child is vaccinated, why would you be afraid going to school getting a deadly disease? I mean, wouldn't that be the fear of the unvaccinated? Well, no, because vaccines aren't 100%. And I want my child amongst as many vaccinated people as possible. So if, if, I, if he's going into a classroom of 27 unvaccinated kids and he's vaccinated, I'm, that's not as safe as him going into a classroom with 30 vaccinated kids. So whatever means we have to add safety to our kids, we talk about school safety all the time, it's more safe for him to be in a classroom full of vaccinated kids than a classroom of unvaccinated kids. So these new OSHA regulations, if I'm if I'm reading them correctly, Mary Lee, do allow employees to choose. It allows the employer to let employees choose whether or not to be vaccinated, but those who choose not have to go through very stringent act activities like every weekly uh, weekly tests and wearing a mask 24/7. How is that different than it might be now? Look, Lena, uh, where I am uh, right now in Southwest Florida one of the a small business but it does have over 100 employees he just came on the news this week saying look i i had to tell my employees they all had to be vaccinated because we just can't afford with all the supply chain issues worker shortage all caused by this Biden administration policies i couldn't afford to have any more expenses to have to test my employees uh, at this point so it's just more constrictions on small businesses and it limits the rights of the people. So right now it's for businesses over 100 employees, but the way that this was done, this uh, federal mandate through OSHA, it's because it was through the emergency powers. But if it's an emergency, it took them two months to enact it and it's not even gonna take effect until January after the Christmas holidays. So it's really not an emergency. And so they're trying to go through the emergency channels instead of going through the proper legislative channels. And that's why I think it's gonna fail uh, because of that, in it's not uh, constitutional. Yeah. yeah, well, the government, OSHA, has until five o'clock Monday afternoon to present mm -hmm. its arguments. We'll see what they say. We have questions about the special session that begins next week. And let's take a break and we'll come back with our guests okay. on our virtual round table in just a minute.
Welcome back. We are in the midst of our roundtable. Glad to have it back with Marilee Cancio and Chris Smith, both influencers, one Republican, one Democrat. Chris, you spent all those years in <laughs> Tallahassee serving in the State House, the State Senate. What do you expect to come out of this special session this coming week? Well, I think with the governor driving the ship, you're going to get some um, some local, well, some, the state taking over from local governments and doing some preemptions on masks and doing preemptions on vaccinations and all of the stuff the governor's railed against. I think it'll be about two or three days of Democrats pushing back and bringing up other issues. But they, at the end of the day, this governor has been very effective in getting the legislature to do its bidding. So you'll probably see one comprehensive bill um, uh, um, preempting local governments from coming up with different COVID-related or medical-related laws. Banning private employer vaccine, we understand, is one of them taking yes. away liability mm -hmm. protections uh, uh, for businesses. That, that Mary Lee, ad address that. That, I think, is probably going to be a real eye, uh, eyebrow raiser for some businesses as they watch this sausage being made. That, that's it, Melana. Uh, you know, like in New York City, one day 9,000 people lost their jobs, 2,300 firefighters couldn't report to work. Uh, that's what Governor DeSantis is trying to do for Florida is to protect jobs. And at the end of the day, what we're living right now with inflation, scary times ahead, uh, you know, people's wages are worth less each day. Uh, just tomorrow, Monday, I have an employee starting. And the reason she's coming to work for my law firm is that we don't mandate the vaccine. We let our employees make their choices. And everyone in my office is vaccinated. One even has the booster, but this new employee we don't require it from her. And I think it's important for people to make their own decisions. And that's what this governor is doing. And that's why the state of Florida is in a much better position than other states around the country. And that's why we see so many people from California, from New York, moving down to Florida, keeping me really busy with all the real estate they're buying. But the reason they're coming <laughs> here is because their economy works. Yeah. Chris, well, uh, on, uh, before on we... the other side. Uh -huh. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and respond. <laughs> well, so I own a restaurant in Fort Lauderdale. And there are a lot of rules that I may not agree with, but for the health and safety of the public, we do it. When I go into that kitchen, all of my cooks better have on a mask. They better have on gloves. They better not be back there sick because it's for the health of others, not just that person. And when you talk about firefighters, firefighters aren't allowed to smoke. They're not allowed to be smokers. I mean, there are certain job requirements that you adhere to to keep your job. So if, if it's adhere to getting vaccination to keep your job, it's the same as not allowing our firefighters to smoke because they're susceptible to cancer and that, that's part of the job requirement for them. So there are a lot of job requirements people have in asking someone to get vaccinated for the health and safety of society as a whole is not going too far. There are a lot of requirements, even at a law firm, uh, OSHA requirements that we adhere to. We may not agree with them, but we adhere to them because it's for the health and safety of everyone else. And I think that's what this all is about. Not but just I think the there has to be a limit. It's everybody. Chris but, Smith. You know, we're talking about everybody. Chris. Mary Lee Cancio, yes. Chris Smith, you know from being right here at the round table, we got to go and we got to go. And uh, it was great to have you. This has been fun. Can't wait to see you back at the table. We'll get hope you here do it in on, the, uh, on the set yeah. soon, we hope. All right. Oh, thank you both. Guys, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. All right. Stay with us. We'll be right back. So you know we're online 24-7, so to re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, grab your phone, scan this QR code, it'll take you right to the section of local10.com we call Twisit. We are that high tech. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us this hour. And as always, remember, stay informed, get involved, have a great Sunday.